everyone how oh, we're doing welcome to a very special interview folks we have none other than tony dolan of venom inc everyone i cannot wait to delve deep into this man's history he is an absolute icon within the metal universe born and raised here in the tune as well so this is gonna be an absolute fucking one we're going to have enough for me anyway, because we're here to see the man himself, good old Tony. So, without further ado, everyone, can you please welcome to the stream, none other than the icon himself, Tony Dolan. Tony, you are live, my friend. Tony, Tony, you are, you are now live, my friend. Oh, thank God for that. You know, it's always nice to be alive. <laughs> nice to see you, Steve-O. How? Good, I hope. Oh, mate. When, when I when starting this two years ago, when so if anyone told me that I'll get to sit down with an absolute icon like yourself, I would not have believed them. <laughs> well, that's very, that's very humbling. Thanks very much. You know, not a problem whatsoever. And also, can I say thank you? Uh, on behalf of my uh, wife Taryn, who drew a picture of you not recent, not too long ago, that was that was my wife. Um, uh, you've shared it around for her. Uh, it's given her a massive confidence boost in in uh, her art. Um, because she, she, she from it was, totally, it was a total surprise when when it came through from her, and and I was absolutely blown away. You know, and uh, showed it to people. They were like, "Oh, wow, wow! It's absolutely amazing." So I had to share it. Excellent. A few more, a few more wrinkles than I would prefer. <laughs> you know, at my age, if, if I don't iron my face every morning, that's how it looks. So no, but it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm glad. Barker, you know, Nick Barker, um, you know, who played with us, of course, Timmy Boogie, Cradle of Filth. Nick Barker wrote underneath. Uh, uh, it looks like and you look like handicap and i thought you know but i took that as a compliment not as a diss yeah so oh well i'm, I'm glad uh, i'm glad you enjoyed it um i really do appreciate Brilliant. for all the show she's amazing she's amazing Thank she you. is she is an absolutely fantastic artist um but sometimes she doesn't give herself enough credit yeah well that's it that's it yeah so thank you very much for that so You're welcome so welcome tony to get heavy uk um we're here to discuss your long history within the metal universe um you, you've been in so many iconic bands adam craft empire of evil mantis with jeff dunn um the legendary venom themselves and of course went went on and formed venom inc of course as well uh what an absolute list of accolades of bands right there insane but yeah, it's, 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 that's very kind of you it's very strange because when you're doing it when you're in it it, it it just every day is the next day and it's only when you look back if someone kind of points or flags something up and you look back and you think oh wow yeah there's kind of a quite the body of work there i guess yeah yeah absolutely insane so early days for you tony can you share some memories of growing up in wild's end because that is where you're originally uh, from, eh? Can you share some uh, yeah, yeah. growing up in Wilds End and how did the environment in influence you as a musician? Well, you know, I was born in Wilton Key and then uh, obviously grew up in uh, Howden and then Wilds End, uh, uh, where we lived, and the Battle Hill Estate and and Howden, and um, uh, and then my mother and father split when I was about around about nine years old, and my mother remarried. And we ended up moving to Canada 
uh, my uncle was in Canada and I guess they just felt there might be a better opportunity. And so we moved there in the very early 80s. And, um, you know, I guess pre that my music was rock and roll, you know, um, my father was a, an old Teddy boy. So it was all Eddie Cochran and, and uh, Bill Haley in the comments and all that kind of stuff, uh, comments and Buddy Holly and stuff. And um, so that was my my listening music. Um and my mum liked Motown, stuff like that. So I listened to Motown, which I loved. And uh, and then in the 70s, of course, it was glam rock and all of that. You know, um, uh, Slade, uh, T-Rex, all that kind of stuff, Bowie. Um, and then we moved to Canada. And when we moved to Canada in the early 80s, uh, uh, 70s, sorry, um, the music was just, it was just classed as rock. There wasn't any kind of genre specific. I mean, there was country and Western and the rest was just rock music. So that was everything from alcohol, funk, to Aerosmith. So the radios just played all that kind of music. So I would be listening to everything from Foreigner to Chris Rea to, you know, just everybody. It was quite eclectic. And um, I just got so used to that. So, um, uh, uh, and then I went to see uh, uh, a band accidentally never heard of them before but my friend's brother had some tickets he took to go see a band at Cobo Hall in Detroit that man was Kiss who was now just wow uh, wow cool. and um, I came out there blew my mind because I was like I didn't know if it was like a circus with music or it was a gig or it was what the fuck was that you know but that had such a massive impact on me and I thought wow you can actually do some amazing things still hadn't considered being a musician had a brilliant summers Lots of activities. You would go fishing at four or five o'clock in the morning. You know, I was totally into the whole Canadian long summers, the Canadian winter sports, ice hockey, everything. And then, um, and then my one day I came in from school, uh, pre high school, and my mom said, yeah, we're, move- we're going back to England. So I figured we were coming back just to visit some family and then we'd be going back to Canada. But we came back and that was it. We weren't going back. So now I was back in the gloom and the doom and the shipyards and the grey and the cold. And I was like, no. But I guess the timing, I went back to high school, saw friends who'd now grown up, you know, so reignited some friendships. But I think the timing was right because punk, I walked back into punk rock. So I came in with long hair with a kiss patch, kiss army patch, Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, and uh, people were like, what the fuck is all that? And they were like smashing it to like the Pistols and the Buzzcocks and Sham 69 and, and, and that whole movement. And, um, you know, nobody in school had heard a kiss. They didn't know what the fuck that was. And I thought, this is amazing. Everybody knows who kiss is. Um, so, but I think I was at an impressionable age where punk rock within a year had just got me so excited about the prospect of playing music that I formed my own band, even though I hadn't played an instrument. <clears throat> I just wanted to express myself. And I think at the back of my head was, you know, um, well, um, if I can't play and I can't sing, I can't be in a band. I can't be like, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin and I can't be like uh, Toto and all these yeah, arena bands. Of course, yeah. Like Floyd. But then seeing punk, you thought, well, actually, all you have to do is to be able to express yourself. If you want to be able to say something, then it doesn't matter if you're not the best guitarist or the best bass player or the best drummer or the best singer. You just have to want to get up there and do it. Yeah. And punk rock allowed you that freedom. So very quickly, uh, it seemed to be that the scene started to move into the new wave of British heavy metal. And I would start to hear bands... Um, you know, like Fist and uh, uh, and and Lone Wolf. Oh, we've lost them. One second, folks. One second. Seem to have lost Tony. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're back. We've got you back there now. All Don't, right, sorry. I'm not and not sorry. quite sure, but we're back. That is the main thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's not talk too much. It's, it's quite all right. <laughs> yes, get in. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, continue. But, yeah, so uh, you know, um, to cut long story short, uh, uh, the punk thing moved into the metal thing. I, I fortunately went to the university to see a punk band who was supporting a, 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 another band I'd never heard of. The punk band I knew, they were local boys, and they told me, you know, you should go and see this band that we're opening, that we're supporting. 
And uh, I walked into the hall in the university, lights went out and Motorhead came on. And that was it for me. After listening to that bass and watching the three of those guys, I was like, oh my God, I don't know how I do it, but I've got to do that. So the combination of, at the back of my head, seeing Kiss doing this, this massive, beautiful view, visual thing, then punk letting me know that I could express myself if I wanted to, and then hearing more ahead with that that speed and that that sound um and i thought what if i took my favorite punk band the dickies and a band like motorhead with that heavy sound and put that together what would that sound like and you know and i kind of formed uh Atom craft with my with my uh, drummer my long-term uh gro grown-up buddy uh, paul spillett and that was it. One, one afternoon, we decided, let's do a band. He then got a drum kit. I borrowed his brother's bass guitar and guitar. We started writing songs, and, and that was it. The Beast was born, if you like. Wow. But in Wall's End, it, because Neat Records was at Wall's End, and then it was just a studio called Impulse, so it was just a fledgling label that Dave Woods had. But I'd see... You know, I'd see musicians going in all the time. I'd see Tyson Dog and and and, and Avenger, like I said, and uh, a Blitzkrieg, and just all of these characters. Uh, my my favorite, the Raven Boys. You know, John and Mark Gallagher. So I'd go and see them play the Mayfair, or see them play Newcastle, or something, or even Sheffield, or something. And then they'd be walking down Walls End High Street, going to Neat Records, and that was kind of like, oh, it 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 was that nothing was just happening in london where you couldn't get to in this in this cocoon of this world you didn't know about all of a sudden the 80s in walls end and newcastle seemed to be yeah we, it's the same for you you can do it too you don't have to be in london you don't have to be exotic and rich you could just be living low fell or live in team valley and still you could do this because there's a record label and you could do shows and stuff so i guess that that whole concoction of seeing bands everywhere you went in Newcastle, if you went to the Mayfair, you went to the Farmer's Rest, the Three Bulls, the, uh, you know, uh, the City Tavern, everybody was in a band or thinking about being in a band or forming a band, uh, just everybody. And, and so it was such a creative time and very, very exciting. And I got, I got dragged into it, yeah. Where were, where were, what was the music scene like in those days, in the 80s? What was, like I say, was there many venues within Newcastle around in them days for you to play, or were I you limited? It was, yeah, it was, it was kind of limited. Of course, you had um, you had uh, the Mayfair, you had Tiffany's, um, of course, the City Hall. Um, there was Central, uh, a place, a, a venue in Central, uh, the Central Centre Hotel. Um, there was a couple of sorted around, but 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 we would just play pubs. You know, the first the first show I did uh, with Amcraft was in a working men's club <laughs> in, you know, the arse end of Wall's End. And we played a walk at gate m m social club. And so nice. you could play social clubs. And, you know, where your fathers, all of all of us were young guys and our fathers had, uh, um, had uh, you know, inns in the unions, the CIU. So we, you could play the clubs. And, of course, uh, there was a big thing about youth centres. So each church community had a, had a church hall and they had a youth community. And we'd, we'd have youth clubs. And the first two shows Venom ever did that I went to see, both of them, was at the Mem Church and the Methodist Church, both like church youth clubs, uh, uh, which, which allowed us to play. We used to rehearse in, you know, church uh, halls and stuff. You know, <laughs> it was like... It, it was just as, as as if the whole world was open up to you, and you could play a local pub. You know, the, you know the uh, the you'd get like ten of your mates in, or five of your mates would come in, and you know know what you were doing. And the rest of the old guys and old girls in there drinking their halves of you know a stout and stuff would be looking at you as if you were frigging mental and thinking, "What the fuck's going on?" <laughs> yeah, you know. But uh, get in. We loved it. And for us, it was like, it was Madison Square Garden, it was Wembley, it was Hammersmith Audion, it was like, fucking get every, in. You know? Every night, every night as well, get in. Yeah, it was a magical time, a magical time, you know, you, you, the, the, on a Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday even, but Friday, Saturday night in, in the north end of the town was wall-to-wall -to -wall hippies and, and, and patchouli 
and and you know uh, you know patches and and leathers and and metal and rock and every kind of music and such such fun everybody was having fun you know i never saw any real fights or any disagreements we'd have them from time to time but nothing serious it was everybody was out to have a great time it was all music based and then of course everybody would pile into a very crammed mayfair and if there wasn't a band on we'd disco until 2 a.m you know slamming on the dance floor everything everything from fleetwood mac to metallica you know it was it was magical magic nice whereabouts was the mayfair i don't think it's there anymore if you no, can recall it's um uh it's it's just some kind of cinema now i think Good. and it was uh um there's a car park behind eldon square um i wonder if that's what if it used to be formerly known as legends bar back in the day no, Legends was a different bar. Right. Legends, Legends was different. Um, you know, another great bar, but um, it was kind of um, it, 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 where the O2 is. If you walk along from where the O2 is, you mm -hmm. come to a junction. If you turn left, there's a car park and you're headed up towards the hair market. And it was right there where the, there's a big uh, movie cinema thing there. And it was a right. ballroom. And... You know, you went downstairs, it was, it was underground, uh, this huge Mayfair ballroom. But everybody had played there, you know, Led Zeppelin stuff. And we'd go on a Friday night, sometimes there'd be a band on, local band. Sometimes you'd go for a show, but, but every Friday and Saturday there was a kind of disco there. And everybody came from all over. And it was, it was fantastic. It was so, so fantastic. When two o'clock came around... Uh, and they played um, Sad to See, It's Time to Go. And they put the lights on and you realise like what the person you've just been necking with looked like. You, <laughs> you know, a lot of shocked faces going, oh shit, when the lights came on. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, everybody, you could feel everybody <laughs> sink a little bit because it was going to be another week before we could do it again. And so your whole week became... You know, you would have a conversation, maybe go to work and have a conversation with someone on a Monday who would say to you, are oh, you going to the Mayfair on Friday, you know, and it, or Saturday. It was it was that kind of vibe, you know. We were getting through our weeks, building it all up to get to the weekends and everybody let rip and it was it was magical, magical. I do feel like sometimes that I was born in the wrong era. That's the kind of yeah. era that I wanted because I've heard yeah. so many stories from, from my old man back in the day. Uh, yeah. Just so many, just weird bands growing up, going to the Mayfair and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. That, some, I just sometimes I just feel like I was born in the wrong era at times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So what? What? So your your bass and vocalist was uh bass your first instrument, or do you did you start anywhere else? Well, as, um, basically, uh, um, you know, once we decided, oh, you know, we're going to do some music. Um, it was like, oh, fuck, I, I suppose I'm going to play something. And my sister had a, a been given, when she was a teenager, my older sister, she's three years older, uh, uh, she'd been given an acoustic guitar. That was the only guitar I knew existed uh, anywhere I could get my hands on it. So I said, could I have that guitar? And, and she was like, yeah, I don't care. She didn't play it. And so I took this acoustic guitar, which had like four strings on it that were rusted because I think they were put on when the guitar was bought in 1971. <laughs> and this was now, you know, 1978 or something. And uh, they were the same strings. And I, I just, I, I didn't know where to buy the strings. I didn't have money to buy the strings. I didn't know anything about coding. So I fumbled my way on these strings, trying to make a noise out of it. And uh, I remember going into the kitchen. My mom was in the kitchen making supper. And I went, oh, look, look, look. And and uh, I played what I thought, the three note walking on the moon. Ba -ba -dum, ba -ba -dum. Uh, I, I, I thought that was like an achievement. And it sounded football like walking on the moon. And she just looked at me and went, <laughs> Oh, very nice, very nice. You're very good. <laughs> and I thought, this is it. I'm, this is my calling. I've made it. Um, but my drummer, Paul, his older brother, he had an amp, a combo, um, a shitty old combo, but he had a copy bass guitar. He had a copy electric SG, and uh, then he had a 12-string acoustic. So Paul was going to be the drummer, so I used to borrow the guitar if he wasn't playing it, and, and we'd try and work out songs you know i'd try and work out how to play a power chord and uh and then i'd play with the bass if he wanted to go well give me a go on the guitar i'd play the bass so i'd just do the same thing except using one finger instead of two um 
But basically, I am um, after seeing Motorhead, I kind of uh, switched. Uh, you know, I was, I was rhythm guitar. I thought, well, I'll play rhythm guitar because I can play rhythm guitar because I'm going to sing. Even though I, I didn't know if I could sing or not, we just, because there was just the two of us, it's like, well, you play drums and I'll play guitar and sing because we need someone to play bass. Um, so it kind of, that's how it manifested itself. But after seeing Motorhead, I, I, I dragged my mother around that Saturday around every music store in Newcastle looking for a bass guitar. And she would said she'd uh, do a higher purchase for me. So I dragged her around to get this bass. Um, uh, but I didn't know it was a bass. I didn't know what it was called. I knew nothing. I just knew it had a weird shape. And um, I went to every store. And, 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 and on the final store in the north end by the hair market, I, I can't remember the name, Sam Garvey, or I can't remember what the store was called. Uh, I think where Jeff got his first flying V. I went in there, started to describe this. I think I want to get a guitar, what kind? And I said, oh, no, that's too many strings. It's only got four strings. Oh, you want a bass? Yeah, 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 the bass. Yeah. And uh, do you know the make? I was like, I don't know. And then I said to the, there was a younger guy there. And I said, uh, well, I actually was at a show at the university and I saw a band there. Uh, like a metal band, but it was a weird shit bass. He went, oh, Motorhead. I was, yeah, that's the band, Motorhead, yeah. And he said, oh, Rickenbacker, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went, yeah, I think we've got a second-hand one here. So, and they brought out this this Rickenbacker. Um, it was cherry, cherry, uh, 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 cherry uh, wood. Um, I mean, I was just blown away. I, I took that in the box. We played the HP, I think it was 200 quid. Um, no strings. Uh, no strap, no amp, no picks, nothing. I just took this in a cardboard box, sat on the bus with it all the way home. And when I got home, I, from the moment I took it upstairs, I was in my room at every moment I could, playing every more headline I could, and just listening and just trying to play. So I learned every motorhead song that Lemmy played on that Rickenbacker bass. Um, and uh, yeah. That was, I just, after that, it was like, I'm just going to play this. I'm just going to play bass and then I'll sing um, because I just loved the way he played rhythmically. You know, it wasn't about being like Lemmy. It was like he had a particular style that, I don't know, I just loved the rhythm. And I think that all came, the rhythmic side of everything came from, you know, that upbringing with uh, Motown and with rock and roll, you know, that that rhythmic groove all the time. You know, I just loved those offbeats and stuff. And, and Lemmy had that kind of fluidity. He was a rhythm guitar player playing on a bass. And that's what I kind of had decided I was. So for me, it was perfect. It was perfect. So, yeah. A presence as well. You know, I mean, no one could command a stage like Lemmy could. The, he was just, yeah, he mean, was just yeah. a mountain of a man on stage, wasn't he? Completely. You know, I remember on, you know, I mean, so many, many stories, many, many stories, but, uh, you know, I remember on the Iron Fist tour and they had the, uh, they had a platform which was going to fly up. Um, and I was at the City Hall and it, the lights went out. There was a drape in front of the stage uh, and I was in the balcony, at the front of the balcony. And uh, the anticipation of them coming, you know, was amazing because, it, you know, also in those days, it wasn't like it is now. It, when they did a new album, they'd release a single. So, and it was usually the air side. You were lucky if it got on top of the pop, so you heard it on, on the radio. Um, but the B side, you didn't know what was on the B side. So there was some excitement. I was going to hear one song, but on the other side was a song I wouldn't, I'd never heard before. And then there was nothing from the album. So you still had no idea what was on the album. So there was no streaming. There was no preamble to the album coming other than they would do the album. Um, and then an answer to her single would go out, the tour would start and the album would be released. So it was kind of at the same time. So it, from a marketing point of view, it was perfect. But from a fan point of view, it was so exciting because you had to be first in the queue to get the single, first in the queue to get the album, then race home because you had to race home to listen to it. I couldn't put it on my phone, which I didn't have. So you had to take it and you had to sit, sit on the bus for an hour, half an hour, two hours to get home, to get upstairs to play the thing so you could hear it for the first time was such a such an uh, uh, such a concept where you were part of the whole thing happening and uh, so that's what happened with Iron Fist so now here I am uh, uh, and here they're going to come and play these songs 
and and I'm watching this black screen and all of a sudden this red light, just a tiny little red light comes across like that, stops in a position and then starts to go up and I realise it's Larry's cigarette. <laughs> and I'm like, I lost my mind. I lost my mind. And then bang, 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 well, it was last time I saw them in Newcastle anyway, because they always played at the City Hall. Uh, yeah. Guaranteed, as soon as you come out, your, your head is battered. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they did, I did, they did, a, they did a spin run. They did uh, uh, Ace of Spades, which I saw at the Hall, and then they spun back round again. They were doing, that was on the release of the Army 82, but then they came back round again to do it, and they played the Mayfair. And I was, you know, you could get right up to the apron of the stage at the Mayfair. It wasn't seated. So, you know, and I I ran straight in, got right next to his mic position and put my head on his bin, on the bass bin for the PA. And, fa- and I stayed like that, staring at his feet, which smelt, of course, his white cowboy boots. He, his socks were a bit iffy. But anyway, so I had this um, overpowering smell of Lemmy's feet, watching him with my head on the rattling around on this ba- bass bin. For for like the two hours they played, and for the whole two weeks after that, I couldn't hear a goddamn thing. <laughs> I just had tinnitus. It was like, Wee! like, but it was so worth it, you know. It was so worth it. It was magical. Oh, what a moment! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So speaking of like formative moments, can you recall a particular moment or experience from your youth in Walls End that solidified your passion for music and set you on the path of becoming? a musician oh you know i think i think there wasn't one definitive moment i think uh, there were some amazing people there was a guitarist called steve burgess uh steve bird who was incredible uh, russ tippins uh, he was with avenger he did the um uh one take no dubs ep and i think too wild to tame um you know there was uh, russ tippins uh, uh from uh, satan uh, uh, went on to do Pariah and uh, just incredible uh, John Gallagher Mark Gallagher you know uh, uh, Brian Ross uh, from Blitzkrieg and Satan and Avenger um, you know uh, Ian Swift uh, Gary Young uh, there was such uh, Alan Hunter from uh, Tyson Dog uh, Steve Bird from Tyson Dog uh, a different one Burdus, Steve Burdus. Um, Evil Evans from Warfare, what became Warfare after the Angelic Upstarts and the Damned. Um, you know, there was just, it was the characters. These were mostly northern characters, mostly Geordies. Of course, of course. course. Um, um, but, uh, although Evil concert, I think, but, you know, we'll give him a bike and still have a t shirt for that. But, um, yeah, it, it was the. They were very, you know, Conrad himself, Conrad Lant, who worked at this, he worked at Neat Records. He worked at Impulse Studios on a job creation scheme. He was a T-boy. And I walked in there to do, uh, to, 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 to see about doing demos for a punk band and the cost and stuff. And the owner said, uh, Steve Thompson, or wasn't the owner, but the studio manager, he said, oh, you can go up. There's a lad up there. He'll show you around. And I went up there and it was Conrad, a very young Conrad, pre-Venom, you know. Um, oh. He was the one who showed us around, just a nice guy. Um, you know, Jeff Mantis, his girlfriend, that they're now together, of course, after all these years, but his first girlfriend, uh, or main girlfriend as well, was um, lived across the road from me, so I saw him all the time. Um, you know, Tony Bray, Clive Archer, you know, the Venom Boys, the whole Venom thing. Everybody was around, so you saw people all the time, and they were all doing their own music. Um and in fact, I, I was at a girl, my girlfriend's friends once, and she was talking about her boyfriend and this new guy she was seeing was in a band. They're going to make a single. I was like, oh my God, they're going to actually make a record. She was like, yeah, yeah. They just done a photo shoot down at Whitley Beer or Timemouth. And I was like, oh, wow. And she had photocopies, black and white photocopies from a fax machine of, of uh, their photos he'd given her. And she showed me them. And they were the photo session that ended up on the back of Welcome to Hell, you know. 
and it was all so it was all just happening so i don't think there was any one moment that inspired i think it was all inspiring each each of us we were all being inspired just from the air from the fact that everybody was doing something and there was a there was an air of excitement about it all about like what was happening you know the, the you know holocene and and uh, all of those kinds of bands and pe people just wanted music and everybody wanted to play music and everybody wanted to engorge themselves on music and it was like it was just it was just fan f fantastic you know it was very christmas you know like um you can enjoy christmas you can have family or no family but you're all aware christmas is happening you see it everywhere there's a there's a motive about it you know uh, uh and there's a sense of it being around you and that's what was happening all the time it was it was effervescent it was everywhere you know this sense of music happening this this new music all the time new bands all the time um, tape trading became a big thing from Europe. I mean, that's I tape traded with Chuck Schuldner, um, you know, uh, 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 Cawthorn, um, you know, the Americans, you know, that's how Laws got into the whole thing. I was doing it with Pete Green, you know, um, from Carnivore. And, and, you know, that's how I found out about Destruction and all of these bands. We were just trading tapes. That's how we found out, you know. Um, and so even that, you know, when you, when you look back now, and see all of these bands, you know, Slayer's retired, and, um, you know, and, 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 and then you've got a, a load of new bands, Forbidden and Carnivore, or out AD you're playing, and, and you see the Teutonics, you know, the, the Sodom, and, and uh, uh, Destruction, and Creator, and, and Tom Warrior is a great friend of mine, you know, with the Celtic Frost, and the new stuff, Trying for Death, he's just put out from BMG, you know, I'm looking at all this stuff, and thinking, why do all these people were just handing little shitty cassettes to each other, and here we are, like, this is, you know, an amazing thing to, to, to go and see a Pantera, to go and see a, 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 a Slipknot, to go and see a, um, a Metallica and see them wearing, you know, even though it wasn't albums I was on, a Venom shirt, a Black Metal shirt or a Welcome to Hell shirt. That is mind-blowing from some kids who went into a local studio in Wild's End and fucking knocked out a couple of fucking albums as rough as fuck, you know, uh, in, in a couple of days. And here you are, these these legendary figures of music now playing to a whole new audience who have no idea. And, you know, that's the influence there. Uh, that's amazing. That's what we did in the Northeast. And I'm really proud of that. You have been a massive influence on so many bands throughout the years, Tony. Um, like you've just said before, the Slipknot. I know Mick Thompson. Uh, he's stated on numerous of times on how much Venom influenced his guitar playing. Oh yeah. Um. So, and I can imagine even still today. Um. I, I know a couple of uh, guys within the Sunderland area. They've said that they are massive fans of Venom Inc. as well. Um. So yeah, even you're still influencing bands today. Cool. You know that's that's that is an amazing thing, you know. And when we when we you did keep it true in 2015, and uh, Oliver Weissheimer, who did it, said, "Listen, if Abaddon was there, would you do some Venom classic Venom songs?" Cronus is not going to do them with these guys, and I was like, "Yeah, okay." So we did that for some fans, and it, it kind of set a fire then. Um, but one thing I'd said to Jeff in particular was, "I want you to." Uh, when you would when we go around we got a tour as much as we can and what i want you to do is i want you to meet these fans and hear their stories because to you you're a 16 year old kid a 17 year old kid whatever you're sitting in your mom and dad's bedroom you're rattling out a bit of sh shitty song on a on a guitar you take it to a rehearsal you just form it into a song and you're quite happy with it all of a sudden in the case of uh, jeff for example with a witching hour it ends up on a record that goes out and then everybody buys it and then everybody buys this shirt and everybody buys into the band and then he goes and doesn't understand how 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 do they know this song? How is this happening? And I said, you need to hear their stories because it's very easy to not see the influence you had, to not see the effect you had. You know, you're here, you're dealing with your day-to-day -day stuff, you're trying to promote your band, you're trying to, you know, do some work, you're trying to write, you're trying to <coughs> make sure you're, you can do this thing. 
and and one of your songs somewhere in the world, probably up a fucking mountain, maybe in fucking, you know, South Korea or something, or Vietnam, in a forest, in a shack somewhere, some kid is listening to you nonstop thinking you are everything and saving their life and giving them hope. You know, we played the Whiskey A Go Go on the first part of the US tour this year. And we did the meet and greet and lots of people came to the meet and greet. But this girl in particular came and she had a black metal shirt on. I went, cool shirt. And she went, yeah, yeah, my mum bought it for me. And I said, oh, that's amazing. She went, yeah, she doesn't know she bought it. I went, what? She went, well, I'm an Indian Muslim. And oh, I was wow. like, oh, shit. And I said, so how come your mum bought the shirt? She went, no, she, I just said, I want to buy a shirt. And so she gave me the money. <laughs> so this is the shirt I bought. And I was like, fucking brilliant. And I said, and does she know you're here seeing Venom, Inc.? And she was like, no, no. She said, but I want to tell you, I had to come. And I want to tell you that your song, uh, 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 I Kneel to Know God, saved my life and changed wow. my world. Wow. And I thought, wow, that's from an Indian Muslim girl. You know, a young Indian Muslim, she must have been about 17. And to, to hear that, you think, wow. Now, you know, th that would be quite easy to never hear that from someone and to never realize that was that song had that effect on anyone. But to hear that told to you, I said to Jeff, this is the meaning of what we do. This is why it's important to talk to these people because you don't know what you're doing uh, connecting to them and you should know that because it's value in that so from the influencing to the the helping is important i i do it myself i'm sure you do too steve when you feel a bit angst you get in there and you rap on i don't know near palm death or <laughs> some slayer for me or whatever it is and you just go ah and uh, there's other times you listen to something more mellow because you feel more mellow and um you know so music is is emotional for us and uh you know, and it, it, it's the one constant you can go to in your life. You know, someone might not want to listen to you. Someone might not be there to hear you. Someone might not give a shit what you think. Someone might be angry at you and doesn't want to talk to you about it. Um, you know, so where do you go? We need some some release. We need something to, that understands us. Music is forever. It's perpetual. You can love it forever. It will love you back forever. And it will always be there. So it's important to us. So it can save our lives. It can help us through those bad times. You know, if it's sitting crying or kicking the wall, whatever it is, but it will give you that uh, support, you know. And so it's important, you know. But it's important to know the connections you're making with fans because that's the whole point. Yeah. And this is, again, this is another thing that I absolutely adore about metal. It doesn't matter your religion, your skin colour, whether no, you're gay, no. straight, bi, doesn't matter what you are in life, at the end of the day, we are one, and that is metalheads. Uh, completely, that's 100%, you're bang on the mark there. You know, it, it, we're living a world of judgment where, you know, people are being judged for their choices and, and politically, religious, like you say, sexually, and, and uh, pronoun and all of that kind of thing. And, you know, for us all time as we make mistakes all the time because it's like, oh, I, I don't know what the, the term I should be doing. So, you know, it can be a minefield. But what I love within our community is exactly that. You can stand at a concert from anybody from, I don't know, obituary to fucking deer side to, to kiss, you know, a, 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 a deep purple. You could be there. Nobody gives a shit what you're wearing, what you look like. You know, they'll probably compliment you rather than diss you. Uh, you can have any shirt on. You can have any piercing. Your hair can be all color. You can be tattooed to fuck. You can have no tattoos. Nobody cares. And it's all one community. And that yep. is the beauty. And it's not just in your neighborhood. It's not just in your local pub. It's across the planet. And when Worldwide. I you you see these kids and and you know sometimes they they feel isolated and they say well you know nobody understands everybody thinks I'm a weirdo I said listen when you're in your own community where there's two or three of you and you listen to Demi Bourgia and you've got your black metal makeup on or whatever yeah you probably look a bit strange to those people who don't get it because they're not in, into it 
But when you go to Vakken, you'll see another 200,000 people, half a million people who look exactly like you and live in the same place, as I said. So go online, find your communities because your brothers and your sisters and your people, you know, whatever the gender, we're all there. We're all there. You just have to hold your hand out. Someone will grab a hold of it and you'll become part of something beyond that. And that's what that's what the beauty of it is. And so individuals, you know, it's where the corporate market and 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 the regular society tries to play down tattooing and piercing and, and, and black metal and death metal and all this underground drug infested crazy music that these kids listen to. They've always done the same thing, tried to make it underground. Why? Because it's made up of a bunch of individuals. They're all individual. You know, we, we, we're not scared to say what we want to say. We're not scared to challenge things. And that's not what a government wants. That's not what any society wants. They don't want you challenging stuff all the time. They want you just going along with it. Okay, the gas price was like 10, 10, 10 pence yesterday, it's 20 pence today, 50 pence next week, 80 pence the week after. Just like deal with it, you know, yeah. and go, don't ask why. Don't ask why, just keep doing it. And uh, our community or people who go, why, why, what the fuck's going on? Um, but that's what we hear. That's what the beauty of our anarchistic uh, uh, way of being is, you know. Definitely, definitely. Uh, you mentioned Vark, and I haven't done Vark yet. But Bloodstock for me is my home. Ah. Bloodstock is my home away from home. I've been going yeah. every year since 2014. I did see, I did see Venom Inc. there the last time you played, which I believe was 2019. I think 2019, yeah. 2018 was because it was, it was just before lockdown. I think it was anyway. That's right. Yeah, we did. I think we. Yeah, we did it twice. We did the once, uh, and then we did it for Black Dahlia, where we because we played Alcatraz. Black Dahlia Murder had lost their singer. Yes. And Vicky, Vicky contacted and said, you know, we need someone at the last minute, and the guys at Bloodstock love you guys. Do you think you might uh, come again? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So we went and did an afternoon spot with, you know, and. You know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful, it, it's, uh, people go, well, it's not as big as some other festivals, you know, but it's it's really important. And it's a, a huge, uh, uh, a huge flag waving for us because the community of people who run it, the people who own it, the people who go, um, it's it's just a wonderful atmosphere. So well done. And it feels, it feels like you're coming home. It feels like it's always there. And you're going home, you know, each year to visit everybody. And uh, the atmosphere is off the map good. And, and they always have amazing bands all over the place. You know, you've got, you've got the Jägermeister stage, the New Blood stage, of course, Sophie, the main stage. So you've got big bands, any band, just this shit going on everywhere. You just think, what an incredibly talented world we live in to of, see all of it. Of course, that uh, New Blood stage as well, because they run metal to the masses. Uh, yeah. throughout the country where you know a, a, an unsigned small band gets a shot at playing on the Absolutely. big on the big stage do you know what I mean yeah how, yeah how many how many festivals do you see doing that you don't see download festival doing that um no in fact what's interesting is I just saw I actually <laughs> sent it to uh uh, uh Vicky and Adam uh I think earlier in the year that I saw another festival not in the UK advertising that they were going to do that kind of thing. Ah, I, and I said, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, someone's, someone's seen that. I wonder where they got that idea from. Mm. But uh, th th this last Bloodstock, there was a band, a Polish band on the New Blood stage who I judged. I did that in Krakow. I went there as a judge and, and um, the band that won, they did Bloodstock this year. So, wow. that, you know, it's even beyond... The UK, it's uh, it's in Australia, it's in um, South America, it's in uh, Europe, you know, uh, and this is amazing. You're bringing bands because some of these bands would never be able to get, you know, a shot at a show in London or in, you know, even in the UK um, and probably not even in Europe, you know, beyond their own country. So Bloodstock's offering, affording them that chance to not only play outside of your country, but introduce yourself to a new audience at Bloodstock. I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, did you did you attend Bloodstock this year? Do you, do you, well, do you no, go as a punter? 
yeah, I had to miss it this year. Um, I mean, because of the band, the Polish band who won, um, my intention was to go and help them and support them and be there for them. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of friends were playing Sacred Reich. And um, I did this Sabatonero project with Wiley on it. And uh, loads of artists uh, had just appeared and they were playing Bloodstock. But, um, yeah, I had some uh, issues, so I wasn't able to go in the end, which was such a shame um, because I was so looking forward to it. So um, it's such a great time to go. But, you know, uh, on to 2024 and let's do it again. Of course, of course, of course. Uh, and you, you mentioned Sacred Wake. I have been waiting many years to see that band. Ah. And, and when they played Bloodstock, I was absolutely buzzing <laughs> got to see them live they were absolutely fantastic live um yeah i was over the moon just just to see them good that was that was uh, it's just great and you know the thing is again real old school but really lovely guys you know um uh like a nuclear assault or something like that john Connolly, dan Lilka, you know phil and, and wiley and the boys they're all such nice guys you know um there's no you know that whole period of things i think uh that whole period of thrash in particular uh um you know flotsam and jetsam and that that whole uh, uh, bay area thing you know there was there was no arrogance there was no rock starness it was just kids doing exactly what we did in the 80s uh, you know with uh, with the new wave was just playing music because you were excited to play music and you couldn't afford to go on vacation so if you were in a band and you could do a tour that was your vacation you know and uh, you might not make any money but you weren't spending any money on a vacation on a holiday so it was it was amazing you know and they always appreciated it and uh I, I appreciate that very much that they're still very humble and very kind and very warm to fans yeah, like you said before as well you mentioned forbidden there's so many of those old school bands are coming back because forbidden are playing bloodstock yeah. next year there's another yeah, band who had never thought i'd see in my lifetime uh so yeah they're, they're a a must for me for next year to go and catch yeah I cannot yeah, wait yeah. you know and and because uh, uh, when we played with nick chris contos was there you know because uh, rob was there machine head boys and and we we talked a lot they watched the show and stuff and and uh chris was saying that the, the band was thinking about it and i said you have to you know because um you know you talk about not being there at the scene of the crime um, you know, oh, I miss those days, but it's like, you know, like I said to a young person the other day, she was 22, uh, doing an interview, and I said, but you live in the best times. Okay, there's there's some of us are missing, but you could still see Kiss, you can still see ACDC, you know, unfortunately, you couldn't see Motorhead or Black Sabbath, but you could a couple of years ago, plus you get to see everything that's happening now that, you know, you, you still can see all those classic black metal bands from Abba to Bema to, to, you know, Emperor and, uh, you know, Ishin and Cradle of Fills. And you get to see the new stuff and you get to see the old thrash stuff, you know, the Testaments, Metallica's, Exodus's. I mean, fucking hell. It's like we didn't have all that back in the day. It was just starting. You know, we, we could only see what was around us, whereas now you can see everything. And, I mean, that is wonderful. So the more of the older bands coming back just to give everybody a flavour of it, fantastic that's fantastic definitely you've, you've mentioned so many bands there who i absolutely adore uh i have seen quite a few of them as well i've been very blessed just to, to get them to see them live before they do call it a final quits do you know what i mean um yeah, yeah that, that, just so glad that, that they're still going and you know just happy to, to play the, music i think i think the thing is steve i said the other day to someone it's like you know what's weird is you don't you know, I know Kiss has called it a, a, a day, uh, for example, but like Dee Snyder says, when I see those Kiss painted coffins and they're all in it, then I'll then I'll know that they're finished. <laughs> Up to that point, I don't trust them. So, and it's one of those things, you know, Kerry would like to go back out with a Slayer, um, of course, because it was his life, you know, and I think that, um, you know, very much like I did with the Venom Inc. thing, was, uh, you know, Conrad was doing his Venom thing. I didn't want to challenge that. Of course, Kronos is Kronos, you know, and you can't not be Kronos. So, but it, it was about, yeah, but if uh, Abaddon and Mantis wanted to do their music also, and they couldn't do it under that flag, then why not, why can't fans see them do it? So that was where I came in and thought, fuck it, I don't give a shit, you know, people are going to throw bricks at me, it doesn't make any difference. I just want fans to have the music. That's what it's about. That's the whole point of it. And if they can see these people, they should see these people. 
But I realized very quickly that you don't retire. You get to a point where you stop doing it because you can't do it like Lemmy, but you don't retire. Yeah. You know, this is what you do. And I think there's a difference. I think, you know, going forward, in, in trying to inspire younger artists when they go, you know, they want to do it. The only question you need to ask yourself is, is it who you are or is it just the idea of being in a band? You know, if you just want it for girls and booze and to be famous, then, you know, you're not going to succeed. That's not going to be what it's about. But if you just do it because you can't do anything else, because this is who you are, because the music makes you feel alive and you just have to do it, then then you're going to make it because that's what it's about. You know, they, they, there could be a lot of money in it. There could be nothing in it. You know, you, it could be beautiful and wonderful and an and, and amazing experience. It could be shit in the back of a van, sleeping on a wet floor in your wet clothes, freezing your nuts off or your other parts off if you don't have nuts. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it could be good, it could be bad. But does that stop you? You know, for every person that said to me, you're shit, you shouldn't do it, but I'm still here doing it, you know? Um, there's lots of things that could make you give up. But if it's who you are, you can't give up. And you can't retire. You just keep doing it until you can't do it anymore. Yeah. You know, bearing in mind, you know, my partner in crime, <laughs> Mr. Mantis, took a fucking heart attack. He physically died. They had to bring him back to life. And, he, you know, 11 weeks later, we were headlining a stage in fucking Finland, then one in Alcatraz, and then we flew to Bloodstock and played Bloodstock. I remember because remember Jeff, Jeff touched on it. During uh, yes. during that live set, um, I was like, yeah. "Wow, holy shit! What what a like I was so thrilled because it was like the only band that actually had a real zombie in it was me, <laughs> me you know. And so, but uh, but yeah, so you know, anybody if that had been any other occupation, you may have taken longer off work. You might not have even returned to work. But it's not what we do; it's who we are, you know. So you just keep going. You just keep going. Wow, absolutely amazing. <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, so, the career journey, you you know, we've already touched on it. You've been part of so many iconic bands. Adam Craft, Empire of Evil, Mantis, Venom, Force Venom, Inc. How have each of these experiences shaped you as a musician? I think, you know, I think uh, uh, they've all been exciting. They've all challenged me a bit more a bit more and I love the challenge and I love to experience the uh, uh, the music and I've been very fortunate because um, within Atomcraft, obviously working with Mantis for so long uh, but the drummers too you know to whatever degree they are you know Abaddon wasn't the best drummer in the world but it was an amazing character uh, uh, and it was an amazing friend you know and uh, other drummers were more proficient but again you know I think for me it's like to be able to play with musicians who I think are quite incredible I mean you know from Atomcraft the original Atomcraft there was the three of us well four of us and then we ended up being the three of us uh, and it was very early doors early pigeons so it was quite raw and very very uh, fresh uh, by the time we came to do, you know, 1985 with uh, with uh, uh, Future Warriors, we'd kind of missed the boat by the time we got to release an album. So we were behind the truck, if as it were. Whereas we'd already started early in the in the game in '79. But by the time we got to release, you know, the whole boat was sailing, and we were still on the beach. But the guitarist, in for for example, you know, Rob Matthew uh, or Rob Matthew Redhead, yeah, the kid was 16, fucking amazing. You know, and and I I get to I saw him mature and grow through at that time, you know, to to be able to play with musicians of this quality, um, you know, not only hear them but play their songs and play with them, uh, you know, I, I that was the most amazing thing. That's the most amazing thing. One of the driving things at the end of Amcraft tour in eighty seven, I think it was eighty eight, was when they invited me. Conrad had relocated to America and Abaddon and the manager asked me to uh, step into Venom to do a new album and you know when people used to go oh, you know you're, you, how did it feel stepping into someone else's boots well 
uh, point of order, I never wear anybody else's boots. I wear my own boots, thanks. But uh, and and I am who I am, and he is who he is. And I didn't try to be anybody else. I was me doing that. But but beyond that, I didn't consider it because I was going to play some great songs that I loved. I was going to write some new songs with my friends and tour with my friends in a band that I loved. So, you know, for me, uh, as a, on an inside perspective, it was very, very different. I didn't look at it the same way. I wasn't trying to be better than anybody else. I wasn't trying to be as good as someone else or as bad as they were. I wasn't trying to create, recreate anything. I was just trying to do, be with my friends and continue the music because I thought, well, if I, if I had a world without a venom, I didn't want it. So yeah. if I have to, if I have to be the one to be there to save it, then then what's the sacrifice? There is none, you know. I get to I get to be there, you know. So I plugged the hole until they reformed in the in the nineties. Fantastic, it's fine by me as long as it didn't die, you know. And now, you know, in 62, 62 years old, Kronos is you know playing beyond the gates next year so you'll see him doing his venom thing you know uh, jeff 63 i'm 60 you know we'll be out there you know abaddon does his thing i mean it's brilliant it's brilliant you know so you're 60 yeah. you didn't look a day hour 30 mid what's, oh, what, what, what's the suit <laughs> what's the secret <laughs> You know what, what I'm going to do is the next time I come up, I'm going to go to Greg's and get you the best sausage. Yes, <laughs> get in. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. love it. So, but you said before that you joined Venom, you you weren't trying to be anyone else. You were just trying to put your no. spin on it. Your just how how you are, just wanting to like continue the music, and like I say, yeah. you're putting your 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 own stamp on it, if you will. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. to totally two different singers at the end of the day, and it was absolutely great. And you've you created some fantastic albums with it as well. Primeval is is still a cracking album. It's absolutely cracking album. Um, I'm mean, really proud of that, you know. And uh, Elvin King, I just did a thing with Elvin King, who just put out the Primeval single off their new album. Uh, and uh, I guessed it on that was Snowy Shaw from you know, Merciful Fate, and of course. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was amazing. And to think that, you know, uh, um, you know that, that album going out in 1990, and here we are in 2023, about to be 2024, and someone's still putting out a single, like from the title track, is, and then asking you to do something on it is still blowing my mind. It's blowing my mind, you know. Uh, uh, and th th those moments, you know, when we're, uh, and this is even beyond me, if you forget the politics and the bitch slapping that they all do within the Venom camp or have done over the years, you know, when we're on the other side of the planet, Costa Rica, and I play Sons of Satan, and they lose their mind, or we play, we're in Irvine, California, um, you know, and we play Lady Lust or Dead of the Night and people lose their mind. They never thought they would ever hear these things. And it's like, that's when it's beyond the people. That's when it's about the music. There's some guy sitting in a dark basement somewhere only listening to the B-sides. And <laughs> they're his favorite songs, the B-side, Mistress of the Whip, uh, you know, all of those kind of women leather in hell, you know, and... Uh, uh, you know, obscure songs from Temples of Ice, you know, the Paul Miller track or, or, or Fairy Tale, or, you know, something from the Wastelands, Wolverine, you know, and they never think they're going to ever hear them live because if they come and see a band, they're going to hear Black Metal, Welcome to Hell, blah, 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 blah. that's what they're going to get. Uh, they're not going to get these deep cuts. And all of a sudden we are there and we're playing these deep cuts and they're like, oh my God. I remember we were in Philadelphia and we played Manitou. I mean, they lost their minds. We're like, holy fuck, they're playing Manitou, which they never, ever, nobody ever thought they'd ever hear live. Even the band said, we can't do that live. But there we were playing it, you know? So that's what it's about to me. So about that richness, that diversity, and and, uh, and sinking your teeth into that. So when people come to me and go, you know, Temples of Ice, you know, regardless of what I think about each album or, or anybody in the camp thinks, it's when a fan comes to you and said that song from that album that might not be your favourite album or might not be the, the reviewed album of the reviews, and they said that album brought me to Venom and changed my life. 
I, I say thank you so much. And, and I always said to people, I don't care when you find Venom. You could find them in the first single. You could find them around about Warhead, Possessed, Calm Before the Storm, uh, Resurrection, Cast in Stone, Temples of Ice, The Wastelands. You could find them later when we did Crucify. You know, I don't care when you find them. I just care that you find them. And I don't care which one you see. I just care that you see them. You know, and that's what I want you to experience. So it's not important. Well, I've seen this one. I've seen that one. I'm going to compare. You don't need to compare. You don't need to compare the albums. You just need to listen to them. You just need to be part of it because uh, it, it was important at the time. Uh, it changed the industry. It made a statement. It allowed so much to happen that was not corporately controlled. Um, and it's still important that there's a, that attitude there. And if it wasn't important, you wouldn't have a discharge out there. You wouldn't have an exploit that's still out there. You know, those bands are still there because we've still got that bite in us that we want to spit out, you know. So yeah. it's important to always have a venom, yeah? Definitely. Couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. Couldn't have said it better myself as well, to be fair, Tony. Um, so the nickname, the Demolition Man. How did the Demolition Man come to be? Well, well we, we were we were a three piece at the time. Uh, I was uh, still in Wars and the guitarist was around the corner, and two of mates knocked on my door, and they said we were just in HMV in Newcastle, and uh, someone gave us a call and said, "Oh, you know, you're managing the band Atomcraft." Could they get to Billingham tonight? Because uh, one of the bands fell apart. Uh, and it was supporting a band called Warrior. I think they were from the USA. This version, I'm, I, I, I loosely remember. Anyway, so they said, like, so should we go? And I was like, fuck, we got to get a load of gear. So we called uh, Avenger and said, could we borrow your back line? Uh, and uh, uh, a mate of ours had his van, so he went to get the back line. I went looking for my guitarist. Um, we found the drummer and said, right, we're going to Billingham, we're playing this show. So we grabbed all of our stuff and hurriedly went down there. And I remember this thing of me, when I knocked on the front door of the guitarist, I was Steve White. And his mom answered the door. I said, Steve, and she went, I think he's upstairs. Steve, and he came to the top of the stairs. I went, we're playing a gig. And he was like, what? I said, yeah, there's a band. We've got to play in Billingham. We're off now. Come on, we got you've got to come. And he was like, right. So he got his guitar, came downstairs, went to his mom, where's my jeans? And he had these favorite patchy flare jeans. She was like, they're in the wash. He fucking took them out, dug down, pulled his jeans out of the wash. And he said, have you got any sprays? She gave him a can of Mr. Sheen <laughs> and he sprayed them. He sprayed them with Mr. Sheen and put them on. And I was like, right, great. I remember all the way through the show, as soon as he started sweating, all I could smell was furniture polish. It was fucking brilliant. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, so we go down. We go down. We set up. We're playing the show. Now, in those days... Uh, everybody did a solo. So a drummer would do a solo, the guitarist would do a solo, the bassist would do a solo. It was just what happened. Born as fuck, but that's that's what everybody did. So, of course, we would know we were going to do that because we're a rock band. We're going to do solos. So uh, it comes to my shot. So I'm going to do this solo. And there was, there was a table in front, and there was two lads on the table who'd just been fucking talking all the way through, really pissing me off because I was like, we're, we're giving it everything we got and they're just like chatting to each other with their fucking pints. So I thought, right, when I do my bass solo, so I ran over to them, thrashing the bass, jumped up on the table uh, to like kick their pints over. As I jumped up on the table, the sound went off. Oh, no. I thinking I can't hear, so I turned around and I pulled me fucking amp over. So oh, I pulled the whole stack over. The flames were going everywhere. Everybody ran on to try and put the flames out in there. So I'd broken it all. What I went all tried this mess everywhere, trying to fix it. And it wasn't even our gear, it was Avengers. I was like, oh, fuck, we've only borrowed it. <laughs> so I was like, shit. So we're trying to get all this. While I'm doing that, the guitarist, Steve, goes to the mic and says, ladies and gentlemen, the demolition man. And that was, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, yeah. And when we would, be, it didn't matter where we were, hotel or borrowing something or, you know, in a friend's house. If if anybody, if I said like, oh, can I have a go? They'd, everybody go, don't give it to him. He'll break it. He will break it. And I did. I always broke it. I go, fuck, I've snapped that. I'm so sorry. 
and not on purpose. It's just, <laughs> just a disaster. Just a disaster. And you've held yeah, on so to that the, that moniker for for years. <laughs> And yeah, it's yeah, that yeah, yeah. it's that still today as well. So like, even if you oh, go, yeah. will they not give you any equipment? Don't give it him because you'll break. It. Oh yeah. Well, my base company, the the the, the sponsor, Bo L, is a Dutch company, and uh, you know I found them how I found them. They came to a show and stuff. So anyway, they were beautiful bass guitars, and they made me a big generator, which is like kind of my model, which is thunderous. But they brought me uh, uh, the first one in, in the case. And the Luther said to me, um, it's, I put it in this brand new gator case. These are special molded ones, you know, like, pff, mate, you'll be able to throw this out of an aeroplane. Now it'll happen to it. And, and so brilliant. That's great. Perfect for me. Uh, so I, off I go. I see him about like 15 months later in the Dynamo in Holland. I come in and he's going, do you want me to have a look at your bass? Just like I said, yeah, she probably needs a bit of a clean, a bit of a setup, yeah, because I haven't, uh, you know, been just playing all the time. And I bring the case in, put it on the floor, and he was, he was going, do you want to bring your bass? I, I brought it. It's there. And he looked at this case and went, what the fuck have you done? And I said, I haven't done anything. And he was like, oh, my God, those cases are impenetrable. He said, just fucking how have you? I'd absolutely kick this shit out of it. And I was like, I don't know. I, I didn't do anything. I just put it up and put it down. But yeah, so he's like, oh my God, you really are the fucking demolition man. You're not safe around anything, are you? I was like, probably not. No. You, di you didn't see that as a kind of a test. It's impenetrable, kind of break this. Yeah, I'm going to test it. I'm going to probably test it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's what he thought. He thought, are oh, you twat? What you've done is you've just gone, right, I'll see if I can break it. I was like, no, I absolutely promise you I haven't. Jeff was like, he's like that with everything. Just don't give him anything. He's terrible. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. That is absolutely we, brilliant. We went to, we went to, we were, uh, I can't remember where we were. We went to someone's house and they said, oh, the local mayor, I think it was in France, or oh, the mayor's coming down. I'd like to invite you to a meal, you know, just to say thank you for playing in the principality or something, because I think it was kind of funded from local government money. I was like, wow, that's very nice, you know. So we go down as this posh affair like that. And I remember, I remember they, they, they gave me the food. While I was talking to his wife, I was eating uh, uh, there. I was eating, putting the fork in the thing, and I... I brought it up and she went, oh dear, I think you need a new fork, my love. And and I bent the fork completely from their cutlery set. And I was like, oh shit. And I didn't even realise I'd done it. And they were like, oh, well, it's okay. Go and get me another fork. Yeah. And fuck out, you're bending the cutlery. We're a guest. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Oh, do a uh, musical evolution over the years how do you feel uh, the heavy metal scene has transformed and what do you think has been the most significant change within the genre I think uh, genres you know I think to say within the genre uh, it, it's be it's become beyond a genre it's it's genres plural uh, I think that's that's a shame. I think it, I feel very much the way Cawthorn felt, but certainly the way Chuck Schuldiner felt as well. Uh, and Tom feels that it shouldn't be separated. It should come back into all one thing. And it can have the differences within it. But to, um, you know, to come across, uh, <clears throat> whereas, you know, you'll have people who won't go to death metal show because it's death metal or won't go to a black metal show because it's black metal, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we'll go to a thrash metal show. In once in Italy, there was a thrash metal event, and uh, a lot of people I knew who were totally into thrash weren't going. And I said, why? You never came. Why didn't you come? And they were like, oh, yeah, because this is modern thrash, not tradition. And it's like, oh, my God, now we have to, now it's a disparity between, it's like, now and it's like it's just fucking thrash and you know you know i remember in the day we'd go to concert i'd go to acdc or whatever it was or you know blow oyster cult and i still had a ted nugent patch on or a motorhead patch or a rose tattoo or whatever it was you know pre all of the extreme stream bands you know we didn't it didn't matter it didn't matter that the guy next to you or the girl next to you was into rainbow and rush and you weren't or they were into fleetwood mac and you weren't you didn't care you know and i think now there's such a uniform that's given all the time and it separates us up and and 
you know, you've already got a segregated community because we're the underground. And within the underground, we have to create an underground. We don't have to create an underground. We just have to come together. It's all acceptable. And every time we two are, I try to take out you know, variation, like I'll have a death metal band, a progressive band, a doom band, or a stoner band. I, I want piece of everything, you know, and it's not just to draw audience towards the one thing, it's to give the whole audience everything. A stoner person coming to see their favorite stoner band might go, actually, I didn't realize black metal sounded like that. That was fucking great. Or I, I didn't, I like traditional heavy metal, um, but that stoner band was real. That doom band was real. You know, so <coughs> it's just about broadening everybody's horizons, breaking down barriers. And I think progressively that's that's kind of what we did was we introduced the the, the, the introduction of the internet, uh, platforms, uh, streaming services, great, because uh, you can be one person, uh, like my friend in Colombia, he's Colombian, but he lived up there, he's got a black metal band called Picado, uh, uh, a lovely uh, guy, basically was writing everything himself, uh, uh, much like a quote on, but he could platform a band up, he could create his artwork, he could promote it all, he could have it on Bandcamp and sell it and, you know, sell merchandise through that, you know. So it's enterprising. So it means that a band that doesn't have any money, doesn't have a record label, doesn't even have a full band, can still be creative. That's brilliant. Um, as far as once you're then signed and stuff, we know the problems with the streaming services and the money disparity and then in order to survive, yeah. you've got to go out yeah. to tour, so you have to sacrifice so much, you have to support yourself financially. That's not easy. That's not easy. So stepping to the next level, it's very different. Um, uh, but it's just a new way of looking at things. It's not, if, you, if you're looking traditionally at the way the industry was, it's not like that. But if you look at what you can do these days, you can still tour, you can still spend the money, you can still make money, you can still, you just have to plug yourself into a new way of working. And, and that's all it is. But I do feel that uh, um, for all the positiveness with, with the um, explosion in music, you know, and, um, and after pandemic, it's no different. It's just like, boom, it's just got all this color coming out now and all kinds of music to see female artists, you know, from Crypto to Burning Witches to, you know, uh, 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 just all of them. Uh, Nervosa, Nervosa who are an, an, yeah. an all-female flash band. Yeah, I mean, fantastic, fantastic, you know, and they're all making their own. And, and, and it's amazing. Uh, uh, it infected rain, and, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, so there's loads and loads and loads of positives. Um, but the only negative that, 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 that hurts me beyond you know, financial implications of how it should work in, within the industry uh, um, is the disparity between you know, the groups. Just, just forget the walls. You know? It doesn't matter. It, you, you know go and see all of the bands and listen to all of the music and, and you may get something out of it you didn't know was there. So don't have preconceptions of the bands. Um, they're not all the same. There is innovative stuff and there's incredible musicians. You know, you could hit, hit black metal with Avengers. Like, I just hate it. It all sounds like shit. I don't, it just does nothing for me. But I swear to God, if you go to a gig and you watch three or four black metal bands, you watch those people playing, the drummers alone, but the guitarist, it's like seven, eight string guitars. You'll come away just going, wow, you'll have a total respect. You'll have a total respect. You know, Bach is Bach, Mozart is Mozart. Whether you listen to it or not, listen to composers. Wow. So, you know, there's something for everybody. Just give yourself that chance, you know. Don't think because it's in a genre, it's all part of one genre. It should be one genre, not just yeah. a million. Mil yeah. It's like a, a sub-genre and a sub-genre into a sub-genre into a sub-genre. Yeah, it's yeah. like, boy, you're fucking going to disappear up your own arse and everything. <laughs> stop, stop. I think, like, I think like every couple of months or something, there's a new genre. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you it know, is. It is hard to keep up at times. That's why I just it just is. just metal, just metal. That's all it is. Just yeah. metal. <laughs> you know, it, it's quite important as well. Is it, the, a point as a point of order? Is that um, you know the the invention of titling your genre 
you know, even stems back from the black metal album because pre that it was just, you know, it's a, it's a term that was loosely used. Heavy metal wasn't really used a lot. And then Venom decided, well, you know, confronted with a magazine cover that had John Bon Jovi on the front saying like, you know, cause you're heavy metal. And they're like, well, if that's heavy metal, we're fucking not heavy metal, are we? And they were going, well, if you're not heavy metal, then what are you? And they went black metal. And that was it. And, you know, then that exploded. Um, of course, the genre is very different to, to Venom, um, but, but it became a genre, uh, a title for a genre. But everybody then wanted to have a title. You know, our, our biggest song for Amcraft was Total Metal. Okay, we did it in 79, but it was Total Metal. You know, then you had Chuck doing Death Metal. You know, that whole Possessed thing with, the, with the Jeff Becerra and Possessed, Death Metal. You know, boom, all of a sudden everybody's looking for a title. And they still are now. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think uh, uh, it, it can be confusing, but don't focus on just having a title. Focus on being individual. You know, because if I see 10 death metal bands and they all sound similar, I see 10 black metal bands or hear 10 black metal bands and they all sound similar uh, or slash bands or whatever, because you're emulating the artists that you love. But the difference was Judas Priest didn't sound anything like ACDC, who didn't sound anything like Blue Oyster Cult, who didn't sound anything like, you know, uh, Iron Maiden, who didn't sound anything like Judas Priest, blah, 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 on and on we go. None of those bands sounded like each other, but yeah. they were all part of the same thing. So be individual. You know, yes, Metallica's my favorite band, but you don't have to sound like Metallica. Metallica or Metallica? Metallica didn't sound like anybody else. So why don't you do something new and you be different? And that's what the key is. So um, don't worry about creating your own genre. Just be who you are. The genre thing will happen anyway. Yeah. It will just happen. It's know? really, it's the people that really put you in that genre in it yes uh, yeah just you, you've said it perfectly just be yourselves be a band go out have fun have a laugh while doing it as well do you know what i mean so, that's it just have yeah, fun. Just... that's it that's it you know it's entertainment you know if you're enjoying it they'll enjoy it you know if you're on stage and you're smiling they'll smile if you're on stage and you're pissed off everybody will know you're pissed off and they'll be pissed off exactly, exactly. so the tune yeah. How how connected do you remain to the music scene within Newcastle today? Are there any uh, local acts that you might be particularly excited about or feel deserve some more recognition? Well, you know, I, to my shame, no, I'm not connected to the town. I I, uh, I don't know what venues exist there now. I mean, trillions, of course. You know, I mean, Mark Jackson is a very dear friend of course from uh, uh he did synth his project Sintita, but he was with us for empire of evil of course he jumps for acid rain and control the storm you know um Citeria, jackie chambers always plays up there in in trillions of course gary holt with exodus they played there girls school who played there so i know lots of people that i know play a trillions and are in that scene but i think uh, to my shame i haven't kept my finger on that pulse so i don't yeah, you know, I haven't even uh, been to Newcastle. I lost both my parents, one uh, pre-pandemic uh, uh, and one at the end of the pandemic. I have one younger sister who still lives up there. Uh, but with touring and my work, I just, I haven't, I haven't been up. And when I had been going up, I never went out. So I never got to see anybody. I didn't even see my mates. You know, I'd like dive up either to record and come straight away because of work or I'd go visit family and move straight away after a couple of days. So I, I just, I have no idea really what's happening in the scene. Um, I can't imagine, I do know lots of players, so, uh, but I don't know their bands or their music so much. But I do know uh, from what I hear back from uh, Sam and a lot of people that I know up there, you know, that there is a lot of movement. Still, it's kind of a rich environment. Um, but it's amazing because uh, some of the problem I found when I was up there was that the, the distance between us and London might as well have been Mars to fucking Venus. You know, it, it, you're in Newcastle. No, nobody really wanted to come all the way up there to see a show. Definitely not. But even to do interviews was like, ugh, fucking pain in the arse. You had to go down on the train to go to London. Yeah. You know? Um, and so there was that. that uh, and I never understood that. 
you know, it's like, but we've got all this fucking amazing stuff going on. Um, and we have to export ourselves. That's just being lazy. But, you know, here I am doing the same thing. It's like you get into an environment where there's something happening constantly. You, you just find you're not going that far up. You just haven't had the chance or you haven't gone, you know. So unless it's put in front of you, unless somebody nudges me and goes, have you heard this? Then I, I'm not looking for it. So, um, and most of the social media stuff and social feeds you've got is about what's happening, you know, in the capitals or, you know, America or Europe or something like that, not locally. So it's like, you know, having local resourcing is very good. I think that's why you're great in this kind of thing, because, you. you know, being based there, you know, you're the flagship, you know, they should be coming to you and feeding all the music to you and talking to you and you can be flying that flag. And, and then we can be finding out about those scenes. I think that was, was missing. Although we had neat records, and that had flagship bands, you know, the Tigers of Bang Tang and all of that. But I think uh, um, what was missing was that we didn't have something, you know, if you were going to get press, it was going to be the Evening Chronicle. There was, now we have platforms that reach beyond uh, Newcastle yep. and you can be living in friggin', you know, Dunstan, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, you know, felling, you know, you could be living uh, in uh, Jarrow and reaching Japan because of social media. So it's like that, that's what I want to see happen to the scene in Newcastle now. I want to see these bands coming together, utilizing these platforms to export themselves out so that people can be aware of this is a, a, a greenhouse of music. It always was a greenhouse of music. And 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 it was it was specific to itself. It was it was grown and bred by itself uh, 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 and it's special because of that and I'd love to see that um, you know be platformed really well I'm, I'm hoping I can make you happy because uh, in my opinion the Newcastle scene is absolutely fucking booming at the minute so many Brilliant. so many on the rise bands it is just too difficult to name them all but um, some personal shout outs for uh, bands like Urson from Sunland uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. who kind of take uh, a lot of influence from yourselves uh, yeah. to definitely if give give them a check out trend kill uh, if you if oh, you are, if you are, yeah, if, yeah. if you are a fan of Pantera you will absolutely love trend kill the yeah, musician kill just the, the musicianship on Johnny uh, on Johnny yeah. the guitar player is unreal absolutely yeah, unreal cast and cast and Tefra cast and Tefra my boys and Tefra uh, Boz, if you like Doom, Stone of Metal with uh, a bit of sludge attached to it as well. Killer Nova for that thrash element. Um, and here in uh, myself, we run a music festival within Newcastle, uh, or just, just outside Newcastle in Gateshead, just out of the time bridge slightly, called yeah. Get Heavy Fest. Uh, we had our first Get Heavy Fest this year. Um Killer. Nine bands, one day, it was absolutely, it was, it was absolutely made, and we streamed it on this very platform that we are now. Do you know what I mean? Fantastic. So where was, where was it at? Where did you? Uh, so where it's Gateshead. Head. So literally, just our the time bridge. You've got a little venue called uh, Downcast Studios. Now, oh, okay, they do recording for bands, band practice yeah. as well. It, it's amazing yeah. what Phil, the owner, has done. So he, he does gigs, he records. So you can go and record your albums there as well. Brilliant, he's got pra practice spaces as well. And as well, he's got a bar and he does food as well. So everything, fantastic. everything is in one place. Wow. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. You've got a little outdoor stage, a little outdoor stage at the back of the of the, yeah. of the the venue. That's where we've done the, the Get Heavy Fest. Um, oh, wow. Like I say, nine bands, first ever time. We sold it out. Uh, we streamed it live, so... Because we've got a lot of viewers here who watch from the states, um, with some really good friends who I've met just doing this uh, over in the states, so they're watching, they're experiencing these bands for the first time as well. Brilliant! That's brilliant! That's brilliant! Do you know brilliant. what I mean? And uh, yeah. because it was so popular, we're doing it again next year as well. Um, Fantastic! Killer Nova, Killer Nova are going to be headlining, um, which uh, catalysts are coming from uh, Scotland, Dundee. 
Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I am the wreckage from Manchester. Goddard from Leeds. Uh, we've got Dystopian Sun coming from uh, Wrexham. And of course, some local bands, like I say, Killanova, Swarms, <laughs> Arab Ball. Two very new, relatively new bands, Divine Image and uh, Morrow's Massacre from, from Newcastle. So the Newcastle Fabulous. scene is booming at the minute, mate. So. Brilliant. And, and you know what's really weird, other than, I think, Swarm, which which were kind of new to me, but Trend Killer stuff. You know, you're mentioning bands, and I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. So when I was going like, yeah, I've got no idea what's I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, of course I do. So, yeah, man, that's amazing. That's brilliant. And I used to live in uh, Bencham. Uh, which is just uh, just by the valley there, Team Valley. So yeah, I know that whole area. So that that's an amazing that the guys done that, and and I have a, such a great uh, a great uh, uh, venue and uh, situation for rehearsing and promoting the music. That's that's brilliant. Yeah, so me and my me and my two partners, um, Doc Imogen and Sean Payne, who was in Cast and Taffer, um right. just couldn't have done it without them too to be honest with you do you know brilliant. what i mean brilliant. um brilliant. So, thank you thank you um really I, positive thing yeah um like i said I, i'm absolutely out of the moon with it um killer there's so many bands coming from within the northeast not just newcastle yeah, yeah. sunderland middlesbrough stockton <laughs> do you know what i mean it's if you get a chance brilliant. just if you get a chance just give them a check out um if you yeah, like I will, absolutely I, like, like, keep me Keep yeah, it we'll do when it is, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. If, if you're following one on Facebook, it's it's all on there. Uh, Brilliant. but I'll be sure I'll, I'll send you an invite. A little VIP, we'll get you a yeah, VIP. Please, <laughs> please, yeah, yeah, I love, I love that. I love That'd be that. brilliant. You. Get you back in the tune for a night, there. Eh? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> get my head kicked in by a load of bands. <laughs> A gate said, Oh my god, a gate. I good old gate seed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know. um, so a career reflection looking back on your extensive career, are there any specific achievements or moments that stand out as uh, particularly rewarding or defining for you? I think, yes, I think that uh, uh, you know, it's specifically the music thing. Uh, specifically musically, because I, I did other stuff as well. But I think uh, sonically, I think, um, you know, to to be able to uh, walk on stage at headline, you know, keep it true with all the stage effects or uh, Hellfest gave us a headline spot uh, after the second time we played Alcatraz, did the same, you know, to be able to 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 do that to go on stage and to play songs to celebrate an album uh, that I didn't do initially, but to celebrate it for the right reasons with, you know, 50,000, 60,000, 100,000 people is quite extraordinary. And, you know, every time I walk on stage, I'm always very grateful wherever we are on the planet. But um, to be able to uh, have those opportunities, I think those are highs. You know, uh, uh, I think a particular moment that will always stay with me uh, beyond any other, because they're all kind of spectacular, really, and and you feel very humbled by it, is turning around at Porosphere, which was in Finland, like I say, 11, 11 weeks after uh, I'd lost Jeff um, from his heart attack, uh, to turn round during a solo and see him smiling, looking like he was 16, uh, so full of life and so that, like, that one moment just staring at him, you know, you know, made me realise how much I loved the guy He's my brother, and and how happy I was that he was there, you know, and uh, and yeah, you know, and why I was doing it, you know, I set out on the journey um, because I I I I didn't know what else I wanted to do, but music spoke to me, and I thought this is who I am. I'm not a shipbuilder. Yeah, I can weld. Yeah, I'm a carpenter. Yeah, I'm a technical engineer. Yeah, I can do many things, but it's not who I am, it's what I do. But this, the music, you know, is who I am. You know, I did acting, I did some movies and TV and stuff, a voiceover work and stuff. But, you know, um, people go, why did you do that? Because you weren't successful. It's like, no, I, I was doing all right. I could have followed it through. 
but it wasn't who I, I didn't, I didn't have that sense of this is who I am doing that. I enjoyed it, of course, and I keep doing it. Yeah, fine. But, you know, when I do the music, it's, I know it's who I am. This is who I am. This is who the demolition man is, you know, that that's who he is. And he wants to be doing it, you know, and who am I to tell him he can't, you know, he's a stronger character than I am. Yeah. So where's, where Tony might follow your rules, the demolition man doesn't follow anybody's rules. He does what the fuck he likes. Um, and he tells me, I want to do this. So I just go, okay, I'll, I'll, off you go. Um, but yeah, that, 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 all of those things are so, make it so wonderful. But that one moment uh, of looking at Jeff and realizing that that was the journey I wanted uh, when we began again, I wanted to take him to those places he would not normally go and show him the the incredible thing that he influenced uh, as a young man. And um, and if I had to take a back seat, I didn't mind. You know, I'd be his taxi driver, but I, I had to show him. I had to show him this is what it is. You know, and for every combative ex-member of any band that you've been in, uh, and certainly... I've been in a few with ex-members and they, they try and justify their position because of jealousies or whatever it is or narcissism or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, what I've managed to do in the last 20 odd years is to show people in particular in the last 20 odd years is to show people the music and the fans are everything because you can write a million songs. You can be the best band in the world. You can be the nicest person or the biggest wanker in the world. If the fans don't buy into it, you've got nothing. You, the fans are everything. And when you when you step off, step out of the hotel or step out of the car or going into a venue or you're tired or you're wet or you're a bit hungry or you're a bit grumpy because you didn't sleep so well, and that fan asks you for a moment of your time to take a photograph or to sign something, and you fuck them off, just remember this. That person is the reason you exist. That person paid for your fucking car or your house or whatever it is. That person bought your records. That person's bought tickets to your show. That person's bought into your career and supported you financially from their hard work, voluntarily giving it to you. The least you can do is give them a minute uh, because you don't know the effect that's going to have. You know, someone calls you up and says, can I talk to you? And you go, nah, sorry. Right. The next day you find out that person hung themselves. What if you'd spoken to them? What if you just said, yeah, you okay? So I always stop just the bus to go, do you want to get on? Because I think that's important. You don't know what people are going through. You don't know what people have to deal with. You don't know, you know, you can call me a wanker and say I'm shit and blah, 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 and hammer it all the time. Fine, you know, whatever, you know that's part of the game but it's like but you know also try and consider you know i know there's a game on social media to attack everything and say everything shit and your crap and what you do is crap and you don't know what you're talking about and blah blah, yeah. blah. but you know i know that's a game and that's fun but sometimes some people aren't as resilient and maybe you're really affecting them and is that fair just for your own gratuitous fun i don't think so so you know if you want to do it, do it. Who am I to say? You know, be an individual. If you want to do that and be a twat, just be a twat if you want. And if you feel justified doing it, feel justified doing it. Yeah. All I can say is, you know, if Iron Maiden put out an album and I'm not an Iron Maiden fan uh, and I don't like the album because I'm not an Iron Maiden fan, I don't go to Bruce Dickinson's personal side to tell him he's a tosser and I think his album sucks. I just don't buy that album. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, if something bothers you, just don't get involved with it then. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Totally with you. Kind of agree more, mate. Kind of agree more. I oh. don't know how I got to that from my... No, no. It was it's absolutely but, fine, mate. Absolutely fine. Uh, but we are getting pretty close to, to my questions at yes. the end. So, any... Uh, for Some inspirational advice for aspiring musicians, especially those from familiar, familiar back, similar backgrounds to yourself. What advice would you give based on your own experience in the music industry? I'd simply say believe in yourself. It, you know, question it. The, the, the question you need to answer, and I think I said this earlier, is uh, am I a musician or am I a person who is in a band? 
do I want to be in a band and why do I want to be in a band or am I meant to play music and if you answer uh, uh, that you're meant to play music then just go and do it it doesn't matter what anybody says it doesn't matter what anybody does it doesn't matter who tells you you can't you'll just do it and if you're a person who wants to be in a band and you equate it for fame money recognition girls free booze whatever it is then you're not going to get all the way. You're not going to get the whole way. Um, you might have a flash moment, but generally, you know, you're not going to go because you're going to give up. You're going to give up. You're going to be bad at it because it's the wrong reasons to do it because it gets dark before it gets light. It gets worse before it gets better. And you've got to be able to be in that van. You're driving up to Scotland to play that club to two people, you know, uh, uh, to end up on vac and playing to a half a million people. You have to. That's what Metallica did, that's what Slayer did, that's what Kiss did, that's what all the bands have done. Deep Purple, you know, the Rolling Stones, nobody started off going, you're amazing, even Queen, you know. People were like, you suck, you're crap, you know, because that's just people. You know, now we know more on social media. But you believe in yourself. If this is who I am, this is who I am, full stop. And nothing stops you. Think of Sylvester Stallone and Rocky, you know who couldn't get a job, he wrote his own film, and they didn't want to put him in it, but he stayed, and he, and what about now? Well, of course, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, think about these people who achieved these things against the odds. Well, they weren't special, they weren't beyond you, they weren't, they were just people, and they just believed that this is what they were, and who they were, and what they were going to do. Same for Metallica, same for anybody. So just believe in yourself. More people will say you can't before the people who say you can. Uh, and as John Sazula, who uh, was a very old friend and had Megaforce and, and saw Metallica on and discovered them and Anthrax and all of that, he said to me, you know, it's as much as when you're looking for a record deal or you're looking for somebody to buy into your enterprise. It doesn't matter how many people say no, I only need one person to say yes. Yeah. So keep that in your mind, you know. Well, I know there's a few bands watching here at this moment in time, uh, so I, I hope they can learn from what you've just said and uh, take it for yeah, themselves yeah. because uh, the War Grave, I know Sorrow is currently here as well. Um, two absolutely fantastic bands. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Then it's all to play for. It's all to play for. It's it's You're in control of it. Go get it. Just go get it. So it's time to open it up to the viewers' questions. But while we'll wait for somebody to type, um, I want to quickly touch on <laughs> when somebody uh, before we're waiting for somebody to type, just quickly touch on this. I understand if you if you can't answer it, but uh, Jeremy Klein recently left Benamig. Um, is that correct? Yes. And yes. Th there's been many many rumours that <laughs> he is supposedly yeah. the new Slipknot drummer. <laughs> <laughs> What no. what what are your thoughts on this? I think that Haley Kramer just left Pop Evil, so maybe he's the new Pop Evil drummer. What oh, are my thoughts on what Mr. Kling being? Well, um, yes, he but has. He, he's had. He's taken a lot of shit uh, over the last couple of weeks. Oh, he has there uh, YouTube. Uh, obviously, he's a he's a tech as well at gigs as well as you know, and people are giving him shit at gigs as well. Um, no way. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's absolutely insane the amount of shit he's been getting online because he's that they're saying you'll never replace Joey, you'll never be Jay, this sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like wow, wow. Well, Sli Slipknot know, I... fans need it. I mean, I'm a massive Slipknot fan. Slipknot's like for yeah. me is the all time favorite. But some of these fans need to rile it back a little bit because at the end of the day, Jeremy yeah. is a cracking drummer. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's a passion. It's a passion that people have. Music is a passion. It becomes, you know, and I've been on both sides of that, you know, because I've had the, uh, you know, Krona stick all the time. So, um, thank fuck I'm not, but <laughs> and I'm sure he's glad he's not me either. But there we are. But, um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I had to let Jeremy go. And I guess logistics, you can't be in a band if you're not in the band. So logistics come into that, I guess. But yeah, um, and, and uh, you know, my opinion on it is that he wasn't going to be the drummer, but he saw a moment where he probably thought he could capitalize on it. So he did his pitch and he thought it would work. 
and uh, it went the wrong way, you know. And uh, so, no, I mean, uh, I spoke to uh, Justin, uh, who's Corey Taylor's drummer, and of course, to Corey himself, who then made a statement going, Stop, don't let this guy troll you, you know. So, I, I think it was a moment that he maybe thought it was an opportunity moment, and he's a, he's a person who takes opportunity and takes the bulls by the bull by the horns and sees what he can make of it. And it's, I think this uh, just was, uh, it's definitely getting some clout. That's for sure. Because so many, yeah. so many YouTubers have touched on this uh, one in particular, the tank, the tech guy. Um, that's where I kind of discovered where Jeremy was going to be. Ru or rumoured anyway yeah. or, or rumoured to be the new Slipknot drummer anyway. Um, and like I said, it was, just curious that was all what your take was but no, you but yeah, you think I mean, but you're thinking pop evil yes well you know because Haley kramer's just announced she's left pop evil so who knows maybe he's going to join pop evil i don't know um who knows? Who knows? no i mean i was just taking the piss but uh you know i think you know i just think it was time you know i want to keep the band fresh uh, Venom Inc. fresh, and Venom Inc. is uh, much like uh, Empire of Evil, much like is me and Jeff, you know, and that's who we are. And, um, you know, there was an opportunity to have uh, some fresh legs and stuff, and I think Jeremy did a great job on the album and stuff, but, you know, I think uh, logistics and and, uh, and some conflict in personality, um, you know, it was just time, it was just time. And, and maybe it had been over time, so we had to restructure. I had to think about that. Uh, Jeff is in incognito because of his partner. Awesome, and I wanted awesome. to go into the new season and the new album, which I'm starting. I wanted to go in with a fresh, uh, fresh, just a fresh feeling. Like, you know, clean out the cupboards, you know, spring clean and stuff. And so, you know, I knew people would be opinionated about it. But I just think that from Jeremy's point of view, with the Slipknot thing, it, it was an opportune moment. He he tried to seize the opportunity to maybe gain himself some more press and um and th and that was why and you know he wasn't uh he wasn't in consideration for the position or anything so it was he just tried to use that i suppose as a moment to hopefully get noticed by them and uh, he was by Corey and and he shot him down in flames so yes but i do, do i think he could do it um, you know I don't know. Uh, I've had lots of people opinionate that he couldn't, uh, some opinion he could. I think Jeremy is adaptable. I think that's his skill, is his adaptability. And I think that he's a smart cookie. And I think that, uh, yeah, he'll seize an opportunity. He knows when to recognize an opportunity and he'll go for it. And I think, you know, he shouldn't... Uh, if he's going to get shit, you know, I guess you're going to get shit. But I, I think that's unnecessary. But, you know, there's the passion, like I say, you have to accept that, uh, you know, if you're going to put yourself out there, um, then you're going to have to take the flack too, isn't it, really? It's of part course. of the job. Yeah. And he, he's a big boy. He can handle that. Trust me. He he won't be, that won't phase him at all, you know. Um, you know, we all want to be loved by everybody. But of course. Of course. Not everyone's going to love no, what you do, is it? Not everyone's going to yeah. love what you do. So, we've got some questions. Are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. Are you ready? So, as predicted. Is there a Greg's, is there a Greg's question? There is. What is your Greg's Not order? <laughs> it was the first one. What is your Greg's oh, order? No. Brilliant. My Greg's order. Well, I would definitely have a cheese and onion pasty. Yeah, classic. I miss cheese and onion pasties. That's the <laughs> one thing. I, I, can't, I can't remember the last time I had one. Well, what about, because uh, living in London, you don't get stotty bread, do you? They don't get stotties over there. Stotty cake. No, we yeah. don't get stotty cakes. Um, I used to buy... We do have Greg's now. Um, so uh, when I go into work, because my day job is I'm an automation engineer. I actually work for Disney. So I'm working for the devil in music and the devil in theatre. But uh, yeah, I walk past the... Uh, I go down the Kingsway towards Covent Garden and I pass... There's a Greg's there. But I haven't seen them do stotty, stotty... Stotty yeah. cake, no. So I no. do miss stotty cake, yes. Yeah, so I'll have a stotty cake, maybe with some peas pudding in. Oh, oh yes. This is where oh. everyone who's currently there, who's not in the northeast, what the fuck are they talking about? Oh my god, fucking! You know what? I used to have a girlfriend who worked at a butcher's in Wall's End on the high street, uh, and it was her her best friend's uncle's, I think, or granddad's shop or whatever. But I, if I went in on a Saturday when they were closing, she'd give me two. Baps with uh, uh, Savaloy dips, 
So I guess that samurai sausage and peas pudding. Yeah. Like, oh my god. It was like <laughs> nectar of the gods. Oh my god, you make me hungry now. Yeah, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> I think I'm making me so hungry to be honest with you. Oh, uh, Twiggle Truffle, uh, you've often spoke uh, spoken about your pride in taking your music to countries other bands uh, don't go to. What's the most surprising place you've played and where have you not toured that you would like to? A uh, surprise was, uh, I think, S- Central America, like Costa Rica and, and uh, Panama and those uh, places because Belize, because you think, you know, you, you, they're very small countries. They're kind of in the middle of jungle and volcanoes, and you know they're not even very wide. Uh, and um, you know, what's the fan base like that? And I remember pulling up at a venue uh, in Costa Rica, and uh, we went in there, and there was a guy who didn't speak English, looked like he was in his mid forties, had a t-shirt, a black metal t-shirt on, but he was a bit rotund. And the T-shirt looked like he bought it when he was 12 or something. It was like this tight as hell. It was halfway up his belly. It was faded to fuck. And I, I went across and tried to speak to him, and he didn't. He just stared at me, didn't speak anything. And I came back and said to him, you know, this guy. So he went across and spoke to him. I said, yeah, he doesn't speak English. I said, but like he's had that T-shirt forever. And uh, so I went across again, tried to speak to him with the promoter. And I found, I said, you know, the guy um, couldn't believe we were there. Didn't believe it, even though he was looking at seeing Mantis, seeing Abaddon, seeing me, but he didn't believe it was real. And he'd, he'd heard the band, had the albums, grown up, thought he'd never, ever leave Costa Rica. He'd never see the band. So I brought him in. I gave him a seat for the sound check. I gave, made sure he had beer and stuff, gave him merchandise and everything, and told the promoter that he's our guest for the night. And at the end of the show, I went out to find him, and he'd gone. But I know that that guy would have just thought, I can't believe that actually happened to me. And so, you know, that that was an amazing thing that I did not expect. And where would we like to go? <clears throat> I think fucking everywhere. I'd love to, you know, ice uh, 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 the ice caps, uh, the moon, Alaska, you know, just everywhere we can go. Come back to the tune. Come back to the tune. And the tune yeah, <laughs> Come back to the we tune. Talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about a City Hall gig to play the City Hall with the, you know, all the special effects and everything. So that would be lovely. Oh, but uh, yeah, you know, I think everywhere, everywhere. Because if there's one fan, they deserve a shot. And that was my example with Costa Rica. He oh, he, he would never have seen this if I hadn't have gone there. So, Excellent. Excellent. Uh, another one from Bags for Dice. Do you have a favourite moment from the Mayfair nights? Oh, my God. So many. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, and they're, all, they're all almost criminal. So <laughs> Probably, Can't talk yeah. about it. Can't talk. Yeah. Oh this will be. God. This will be submitted as evidence. <laughs> yeah, lots of blood, lots of gore, lots of stuff like that. Yeah. No, every moment, every moment, every weekend was like something mental. But I remember, you know, when you you would go down the stairs, there would be the cloakroom. I never put my coat in, of course. But you would go through into the hall, and then there was an upstairs bar to your left, and um, you know, first thing we used to do because by that point we'd been to the all the pubs, the Jubilee or the Man in the Moon, the Jubilee, which became Trillions, uh, uh, Three Bulls, Haymarket, Farmer's Rest, City Town. So we were up. We were wankered anyway because we'd already started at War's End in the Anson before we'd gone to town. So we were already wankered. So when, by the time we got in the Mayfair, you were very lucky if you had any money left. So... Uh, and you wanted to get chips later when you were really starving after you'd been <laughs> headbanging for a while. So we'd walk around. The first thing you do was walk around and see who was on the dance floor, but at the same time observe the tables because when people went to the dance floor, they'd leave the tables unguarded with their pints on. So then you could just like help yourself to the booze. So when they got back, someone had drank their drinks. You know, usually there was one person on guard, but sometimes there was nobody. So you just go have a walk around, pick up whatever drink was there, drink it, and then just walk off. But that upstairs bar, we figured that one of the pumps was always on. So <laughs> we would we would walk around and then get there, keep an eye out for the bouncers, and then someone would 
like jump over and we'd fill as many pint glasses as we could and then like grab them all and then take them to a table and hide them in a corner. Uh, and sometimes we put our coats over and make someone was guarding them. And then that was our booze stash for the night. So, yeah, just amazing moments, amazing moments there. Yeah, all of it, mental. But lots of fights, which were great fights, so <laughs> really good fighting. And the thing was, good old scrap. You know, a tear up. There'd be a total tear up, and then everybody just got on with it. You know, it was like, oh well, there we go. It was kind of like one of those gypsy family fights, you know, where like everybody go right, you two, that's it, and they'd break the shit out of each other, and then everybody go and sit down and have a dinner together. <laughs> and it was like brilliant. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. We've got War Grave who has a band from London. They have asked, what was the most impactful show you've ever played and why? Ooh, impactful. Wow. Wow. I think uh, um, there was quite a few. I think, yeah, I think maybe London Marquee, maybe at the Marquee. And I think that was uh, two times for me. One was with Slayer on the Hello Waits tour as Atomcraft, uh, and why? Because we got to the third song, uh, the power went out, and I took a, we took a sledgehammer to the drum kit and smashed the fuck out of the... Uh, was this Demolition was this demolition Man stuff again, was it? <laughs> demolition, yeah, totally. To I nearly chopped my finger off. But the bass that I smashed up was the, was a flying V bass with an inverted crucifix that Kronos used on the original Hammersmith uh, show. Right. Video. If you see that, he uses it uh, on that. And that, that was the base I smashed up that night. Uh, so that was amazing. Of course, we were Slayer, you know, and that was early on. So that was brilliant for me. And I think uh, then when the marquee had moved to, it moved from Wardour Street to Charing Cross. Um, well, there's a pub there now, but uh, it moved to, to Montague Pike, I think, was uh, with the new marquee. Uh, and we played there where we recorded the live 90 video as Venom. And that was impactful because we were shooting the video. That was an amazing day. Um, it wasn't the same kind of marquee, but it still had the name. Uh, but yeah, that whole day was kind of amazing. And of course, it was the first time we played any any music from Primeval as Venom. So uh, yeah, so that was, that was a great impactful show. Um, yeah, yeah. So Grimdor, who was from the Northeast, who was the best band you have played with, and which new band would you like to collaborate with? Fuck, you know, that's like impossible. Best band we played with, you know. Uh, uh, I, I mean, collaborations, I'm I'm open for so much stuff, you know. I, I do so many collaborations. Uh, uh, no Riser I did from, uh, who are you know, a Colombian death metal band, amazing. Uh, uh, Elvin King, like I say, I just did with Snowy Shaw. We did cover of Prime Evil. Uh, there's so many bands. Infected Rain, I'd love to do something with. Uh, you know, Ginger, amazing. Uh, um, uh, newer bands coming through. Fuck. You know, there's a list as long as you're on. I mean, there's just, just, there's so much amazing stuff, you know. It, it just excites me completely. Um, I mean, I wouldn't like to do. You know, with a newer band, I wouldn't want to do just an appearance, like, oh, could you sing this lyric or, do, do, you know, because I, I get that a lot. And that's cool, but I'd like to actually do something, like do something with them, like write something specifically with them to produce. So I don't know, that would be like fishing because it's like, you know, I know about a yeah. hundred bands, you'd go all of them, <laughs> you know, all of them. Um, Erson, Erson yeah. from 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 the Newcastle Sunderland area, they would yeah. absolutely love to do that. I mean, it would be amazing. Trend kill, you know. I mean, all I, you know. I love, I love Doom. I love, I love you know Stoner. I love Thrash. I love black metal. You know, so it's like wow, the, the the possibilities become endless. You know, uh, and it's I find it always exciting. I am doing something with Evil Evans. You know, who was Warfare. Um, and he was uh, uh, with the uh, the uh, Angelic Gov starts a bit the dam and stuff. So yeah, I'll be doing something with him a collaboration. But um, but yeah, with newer bands that would be very exciting. It would be so so exciting to write something in particular. And but one of the best bands. I don't know, it's difficult, you know, because you could say Metallica. You know, watching Metallica play, but you know, because we do all the big festivals, I get to see. You know, luckily. Luckily, and I, and I am lucky that I do that. I get to see everybody, and 
you know, I see the most amazing things. I couldn't pick one because they're all amazing in their own rights, you know. Uh, uh, very, very different, and, and I'm very lucky because of that. So I have to say all of the above, <laughs> just to be fair. Yeah. I, I, yeah. There, you're not wrong. There is too many to choose from, isn't it? And it it's like, you know, picking a needle in a haystack. <laughs> Yeah, well, your bet your favorite. It's like, oh my god, how do you think your absolute favorite? Yeah. So we've got. Uh, I think I can only see this will be the last question. I think from Bags for Dice. Do okay. you have any unexpected restriction? Um, is it was that sorry reactions to your sets in the work and men's club back in the day? <laughs> yes, not like fucking get off. That was basically that was a lot of that. Was it? Yeah. I think, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. What a load of shit, you know, <laughs> you get that as well, a load of fucking shit. Uh, uh, um, you know, um, it was strange, you know, because you play, like I remember we played in Walker Gate, at a worker men's club in Walker Gate, because the drummer Paul, his dad was on the committee or something. And, of course, our mates were coming down. Uh, the bar was snooker and, you know, general working men's club stuff going on. And then upstairs was the function room. We were in the function room and uh, we made our own poster. And, you know, uh, my my parents came down. They were separate, but they came down with their partners and friends and they invited some of their friends. And, of course, there was four of us in the band at the minute. And so at, at that time, I was playing rhythm guitar and singing. So, you know, everybody's parents came down and brought their, their neighbours and stuff like that. And then we had our mates in there you know um any of them yeah any by any chance any of them shows but have been recorded you know no no yeah. but i i have got early recordings from that period which is i think uh yeah uh, end of 78 into 79 i've got like recordings from their demos and stuff like that but not the live shows we didn't know how to do that you know mm. uh um uh, so h how do we do that? We, we figured out you just take one of those old tape machines and double press the things and then play and record at the same time. And that's how you get it. That's how the the demos of Venom did. Uh, uh, they just went out on a box set. That's how Jeff recorded them on his dad's uh, cassette player, you know, by doing that. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, you can imagine and we're doing this, we're doing our best heavy metal impersonation to these you know, these people who go out on a Saturday night to dance and stuff and your mum and dad and who play bingo and um, snooker and, like, you know, uh, it's, uh, and work in the shipyards or the local TV. <laughs> fucking watching these kids, these long gay kids doing their version of Motorhead meets fuck knows what. <laughs> they must have thought we were mental, you know. And the, the, most, the, most <laughs> common chat, the most common chat I ever had was, get your hair cut. <laughs> get your hair cut. <laughs> Get a proper job and get your hair cut. I was like, fucking hell. Well, look what happened. Look what happened. Oh, I'm you? the same, mate. That's why I wear the cap now. I'm the same. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's like, fucking hell. Don't worry me so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> mate. Well, but you know, you know, those days and that kind of environment uh, was still amazing when you think about it, didn't it? And it made you want to break out. You know, you could say, I live in a shit area. I live in a shit place. I don't have the support from my family or friends and my job sucks or whatever. And I want to do this and I want to get out. But if everything was easy, if everybody loved you and everybody supported you, you'd never leave. You'd never leave. So if, if you feel you got to leave because you want to do that, then, then embrace that. Embrace that. Love it. Because that's what's going to drive you on. That's going to push you out. That's what's going to make you go. You know, you can always go back and love them still. You know, it's not going to change, but you can go beyond that, you know, and uh, use that energy. Use that. It's not, it's, it may feel negative, but use that energy to inspire you to go and, and get the crown for yourself. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people give the tune a lot of flack, to be honest with you, but, but oh, absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's a driving engine. It's an absolute love. It. It's incredible, you know. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. I, could, I wouldn't. Yeah. I couldn't see myself being anywhere else. To be honest with you. Couldn't no. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. It's one of the things that's in your heart. You, you never. It never goes. You know. And and I've never been a nationalist or never been. You know, kind of one of those people. I'm like, I couldn't give a fuck or whatever. You know. But 
when people talk about uh, England, I feel a bit. But if they talk about Newcastle, I feel a lot. I'm like, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, <laughs> not like, no, sorry. You know what I mean? We're, well, like, I remember before. Kind of I remember before we went live because uh, I thought as if you had lost the Geordie accent, and I feel like we have accomplished it throughout this. You, the, you it it's back, coming it's back. Great. It has slowly came back. So the I Samuel did. Samuloy Dips, it did it. <laughs> For anyone who's watching live, um, when before we went live, we we're having a bit of crap behind in the backstage, um, and he, he, the, the 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 northern accent had pretty much gone. But and I and I made it a point that we'll we'll get it back throughout the night, and I feel as if we've done it tonight. We've achieved it. Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> And we even got a way I man, even there's we'll get in. Spotty <laughs> fucking dog. I love it. <laughs> uh, Tony, can I just say thank you so so much for doing this, man? Uh I, I kind of thank you enough. Look, Steve, I think you know you, you had the patience of a saint and uh we had to reschedule and reschedule because <laughs> It is what I'm it is. Spaz. I'm, spaz. <laughs> I'm just quite all right. All right. You know, I'm not. I'm not quite Joe Biden, you know. But I'm. Close <laughs> it's enough. quite but, all right, uh, man. Quite all right. And well, you had the patience, and, and I really, really loved this. And thank you so much for allowing me on. And thank you guys for supporting Steve, letting him support you, and 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 bigging up your scene. And and you know, just go for it. Support live music. Support his fest. You know, it's all amazing, and hopefully, I'll get to see you in 2024. If you're down here, give me a tag on Facebook. If you're playing, I'll come along. And if I'm hoping to, uh, I'm not exactly sure exactly whereabouts in London you are, but I am hoping, fingers crossed, I am hoping to be at the uh, London Metal Coalition Fest, which is end, ah, okay, um, which is where a lot of bands who were promoted on this channel, um, brilliant. I think that's at the back end of August, early September ish. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. That, and in uh, Cam, I think Cam is it Camden or is it New Cross? I, I'm not too sure. Wargrave, you are yeah. currently in chat. You can because he's part of the London metal scene. He'll maybe able to give oh, a, okay. the exact date of when the London. Uh, brilliant, brilliant. So yeah, it is Camden. I'm only, I'm, I'm only in North London, and 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 uh, you know Camden and the whole scene's like New New away. Cross Inn. That's where New Cross Inn. The New Cross, which is uh, New Cross, I know. I used to South London, but they're very easy. So, yeah. yeah, New Cross. So yeah, we, we've got our we've got our Get Heavy Fest on the seventeenth of August in Gaty, and I think it's the weekend, Perfect. the weekend after, or the weekend. I think it's like two weeks after Get Heavy Fest. Then I've said Killer. I'll try and get myself doing to London. So I'll definitely, yeah, but it. definitely, I definitely hit you. Up. For yeah, sure. I'll come. I'll come new cross. So you will. Uh, we'll have a few. But it's a really nice venue. Really great woman who runs our thing, and and a good team down there. So really good, good, good place to be. So perfect, excellent, perfect, excellent. Cheers very much, man. And I've also got to give a shout out to Tony Douglas because uh, ah yeah, he well, put this he put this in place. Um, he did. He random. Did. Thank, ra you, Tone. Thank you, Tony. Uh, he's but he's not here. Bless him. He he messaged he messaged us and he said he had a late meeting. He says, "Can I watch this back later?" I said, "Yes, mate." Um, no, you fucking can't. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you, fuck you, you lazy bastard, you lazy lazy bastard. You did all this and we have worked our fucking tits off and you're not even. Here. <laughs> Twat. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have a heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh mate anything that you would like to plug before we call it a day anything no just to say you know um, there's lots of stuff I'm doing the new Sabat Nero album I did the one uh, Leuma the Pharaoh which is the Iron Man uh, which was a tribute to Black Sabbath with lots of guests on there Marty Friedman and Snowy Shaw John Gallagher and lots of it wow. I'm doing the wow. second one which is uh, uh, Overkill um, so it's a tribute to Motorhead's Habit and Nero Overkill nice. and uh, again incredible guests coming in um, I, I, go through them I was just are you, allowed to, are you allowed to give any names um, well no I won't just at the minute fair enough fair people, enough but, but amazing guests coming in um, that's on Facebook on Instagram Sabbath and Nero you can keep up to date with that of course the new Venom Inc album uh, I'm getting underway I'm, I'm finishing off the new Atomcraft pieces and uh yeah and, and other interesting stuff uh you know 
there's something for Metallica, something for uh, Evo, for um, LG Ward's uh, commemoration and warfare and so Yeah, lots and lots of good stuff going on. So, And, of course, we're going to be doing a European tour. So hopefully we can do a show in Newcastle at the City Hall. We'll have a couple of other shows uh, uh, in the UK. And, uh, yeah, just keep abreast, keep in touch, you know. Um, yeah, it's all good. It's all on fire. So we'll see you out there. And, Excellent. Uh, if you want to be in touch, you need, if you need, you think you, you there's a burning question you have or you you think I might be able to help with something or you just want to chat or you just want to follow, then hit me up on social media. Oh, yeah, we'll, you know, thank uh, you. I respond as much as I can to Thank you. So. I will, I will do. I will Very do. Very welcome. Quick question though from Muzzy Musgrove. The album that you okay. just mentioned though with the, the guests and stuff, the, the one that's already out, is, is that on Spotify? Um, yes, I think so. Back Nero is on Spotify, yes. It's through an Italian label, Time to Kill. And um, I didn't know if I had a copy anywhere. Um, I haven't got a copy with me at the minute. But um, yes, yeah, Sabata Nero. Sabata Nero. It's on, it's on for streaming. So yeah, it should be on Spotify. You can have a look. Uh, iTunes, I know it's up there. So Hold on. There you uh, go. yeah, but all the, if, you, if you're on Facebook and you, you put in Sabata Nero, uh, uh, Sabaton Aero, um, you'll go to the page and all the links are there, so you should be able to see the links where you can go and have a listen to some stuff. And we've got lots of videos up there, we did some videos and stuff, so uh, with the obituary guys and everything else. So, yeah, lots of pleasant stuff to have a listen to. Yeah, buzzing, mate, absolutely buzzing. Good stuff, good stuff. Right, well, well, thank you very much. We well, did go a little bit longer than uh, I think I said about an hour, but I think we've done two, mate. <laughs> <laughs> gobshite. I tell you, man, I'm a gobshite. No, I mean, it's uh, absolutely. Right. See what I mean, right there? A gobshite. I mean, you wouldn't hear yeah, that exactly doing. Well. You wouldn't hear that doing London, would you? Gobshite. Nah, <laughs> nah. You can take the man out the north, but you're going to take the north. Exactly, the north. mate. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once again, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I am obviously when we finish, I am going to continue for a little bit. I'll be spinning some some tracks. If you want to come and check us out on on Twitch. Do it, uh, do it, yeah do it. so um right. yeah so everyone who's watching live don't go anywhere i will be taking a quick 15 well i wouldn't even say 15, 10 minute break uh, and then i'll be back to spin some tunes for you so uh and I want to say thank you thank you steve thank you everybody be good and i'll see you out there on the road and no thank worries. you very much again and i'm going to end it like this the rules of the pit are the rules for life if someone falls we we'll pick them up yes baby i love it Take care, everyone. Be good.